Welcome back. So, Scream 6 has dropped on Blu-ray, 4K, DVD if they still make it. Maybe there's a VHS floating out there because people love that type of stuff. And our last Scream Easter egg video, we got so many comments with so many good Easter eggs that we missed and a couple I got wrong. So, for those that are wondering, because I saw a couple of comments like, wow, you got the Easter egg video out really quick. Man, when it comes to doing these, it's multiple trips to the theaters. First time is just to sit down, like, ah, oh, I love it. <laughs> Second time is like, oh, let me, nope, oh, gotta take the notes. Third time is like, all right, I got all my notes down, so now I gotta make sure that they're right. And then when you watch the next time, it's like, I can sneak a picture in. And that's what I'm doing. Then you gotta write it, and then you gotta film it, and then the editing for an Easter egg video, especially one of this size, is long. So like that video was over 20 hours of work. Yeah. And several trips to the theater in one week. So if I miss something, thank you for not killing me for it, but thank you for bringing it up so that we can do a follow-up like we're going to do with this video. So we're gonna dive into the meat of the movie, and then at the end, we're gonna tell you about all the costumes that are out there. In the opening scene, we meet Laura Crane, played by Samara Weaving. She's wearing a greenish yellow dress, which is similar to outfits worn by Gail Weathers in Scream 1996 and by Jennifer Jolie, who portrayed Gail in Scream 3. Laura's first name is a nod to Sydney's alias in Scream 3 when she was in hiding, and her last name is a nod to Marion Crane from Psycho. She is waiting for her blind date, Reggie, who calls instead. Reggie's name is a nod to Reggie Conquest, who played Deputy Farney in Scream 5. The contact info for Reggie is actually a photo of Samara Weaving's husband and dog in real life. Reggie, however, is a catfish. It's Laura's student, Jason. His name is one of the many references to Jason Voorhees and Friday the 13th. Jason lures Laura into the alley where he kills her in what may be one of the best openings in the franchise, and some of our commenters feel it is a reference to Helen and I Know What You Did Last Summer. It is similar, but I will leave it to you to tell us if you think that is what they're referencing in this shot. Jason then quickly changes and heads home where he passes Tara, who asks him if he is going to the OKB party. OKB is Omega Kappa Beta, which is Derek's fraternity in Scream 2, and where we will see everyone later. When Jason arrives at his apartment, he passes by four posters in the hallway. The first poster is 1920's Der Gollum, 1927's Metropolis, a Dracula poster, and a Psycho poster. Jason put his mask away in the closet where we see two official Stab costumes hanging up, along with holsters for Stab 3, 4, and 5. Jason is called by a ghost face who he thinks is Greg because he is using the voice changer. As Jason walks through the apartment, we see several more Easter eggs. While he pours himself a drink, we see a poster for Phantom of the Opera just over his shoulder. And when he sits down in the living room, still talking to Ghostface, he is watching Jason Takes Manhattan. Which is fitting because Scream 6 takes place in Manhattan. Jason's shirt has a meaning all into itself. It says, Moshe de Valuto Grigio, which is Italian for the movie Four Flies on Grey Velvet. That movie is about a person who accidentally kills a man and then is tormented by someone who witnessed the event. The original plot for Wes Craven's Scream 5, the follow-up to Scream 4. Ghostface questions Jason's motive in killing the professor, in which he responds with that she gave him a C- on his giallo paper. Jason begins to get frustrated with Ghostface and suspects that maybe he isn't talking to Greg. So he goes to look for him during a game of hot and cold. Above the TV is a set of Ghostface nesting dolls. 
On the wall of three posters, Vertigo, Stab One, and one of the true crime podcasts, The Last Podcast on the Left. Now, not an Easter egg, but in case you didn't notice, pulled up on his computer is the Woodsboro Truther. The Vertigo poster is also a reference to Scream 3, where Sarah Darling says, The whole shower thing's been done. Vertigo, hello. When she actually means psycho. Now, also remember that the Vertigo and Psycho posters were in Randy Meek's Memorial Theater. In his bedroom, we see a poster for another podcast, We Hate Movies. The hot and cold game leads Jason back to the fridge where there are several things to look at. In the top left-hand corner of the refrigerator, there is a picture of a girl who looks like Casey Becker. This is the actress who played her in Richie's movie that we see later on. Below that is a Ice Nine Kills flyer that singer Spencer Charnis created for the film. And then to the right of that is a cosmic monster flyer that features Tachulu. Ghostface leads Jason to the fridge and when he opens it, we find Greg chopped up. A reference to Friday the 13th part two with Pamela Voorhees' head in the refrigerator before Jason kills Alice. After Jason is killed, we move on to Sam's therapy session with Dr. Stone. But first, Dr. Stone's last name is the same last name of Jennifer Jolie's bodyguard, Stephen Stone. Stone is an obvious horror fan as we see several figures from Handmade by Robots, the first set being a reference to Jenna Ortega's TV show, Wednesday. On the shelf behind him is Pugsley Adams, Uncle Fester, Gomez Adams, Wednesday, and Morticia Adams. Also on the shelf is Leatherface from Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Annabelle, and you can just make out the top of Pennywise. And as Sam goes to leave, we see two more figures, another Leatherface and a Ghostface one. We also see a statue of Pazuzu from The Exorcist on the shelf. How crazy is that the shrink that you go to see has a toy of the mass killer who tried to kill you? I don't know if I'd be like super excited or super freaked out <laughs> or a little of well, both. <laughs> take out your horror mind. That's throw that true. To the side. That's true. You're I'm a just Sam. a patient, right? Yes. Okay. You're so... just Sam because Sam was not a horror fan. That that's that's like. true. Okay. So then I'm probably going to be like, maybe he's the killer. Yeah. Like who, who do you trust? He's a fan of the killer there because he's got the ghost face right on the shelf. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And I think Sam should have paid a little more attention to what was up there i mean i've gone to therapy sessions myself and i kind of know everything that's like on display in the office so yeah probably be a little more aware of your surroundings yeah especially since he was a dick yeah really after sam leaves the doctor she unknowingly passes the ghost face crime scene which takes place in the elm court building a subtle nod to nightmare on elm street <laughs> When Sam arrives back at the apartment, we see a painting hanging on the wall that appears to be modeled after the famous painting of a farmer and his daughter, not his wife. The painting title is American Gothic, which is a bit of a wordplay for the house behind them. See, the house's architectural style is known as Carpenter Gothic. At the frat party, we see a guy in a toga costume He's coming down the steps inside. To his left, we see a one-way street sign pointing up the steps. This is a nod for Animal House. Mindy is dressed up like an activist, Stormy de Larverie. Tara is dressed up like a pirate, which is a reference to Matt and Tyler's short film on the movie VHS, along with a person dressed up like a teddy bear. Now, a third character was planned as a homage to their time with VHS. That person was supposed to dress up as the Unabomber but fortunately got COVID. Ethan is wearing a cardboard suit of armor like a knight. It's a reference to a little indie horror film called The Murder Party, and that was directed by Jeremy Solner. We meet Date Rape Frankie. Oh, I hate Date Rape Frankie. As Chad lovingly calls yeah. him. He is dressed up as Joel Goodson from Risky Business. Big shocker. Date Rape Frankie asked. You Omega Beta Zeta? No, not yet, but I might rush it. Oh. Omega Beta Zeta was the sorority that Cece belonged to in Scream 2. 
After Sam breaks up the party and forces Tara to go home, we fast forward ahead a little bit and we're going to jump into Tara's room and on her wall is a poster for Ed Ryan's band featuring Bonnie Curtis, the producer from Saving Private Ryan. Tara changes into a white and black striped shirt, the same one that Jill Roberts wore in Scream 4. On the couch in the other room, we see Mindy sitting with Annika eating popcorn out of a Jiffy Pop container. A nod to Casey Becker from Scream 1 when she is cooking Jiffy Pop on the stove. Annika's last name is Kayako, which is a play on the spelling of Kayako's name from The Grudge. After the news breaks of the murders of Jason and Greg, Detective Bailey calls Sam and tells her that she has to come down to the station because he found her driver's license at the scene. The address on the license is 2419 Solar Drive, Los Angeles, California, Wes Craven's address. The expiration date on the license is Halloween. As Sam and Tara leave for the police station, they are attacked by a ghost face wearing an aged and cracked mask in a similar fashion to Michael Myers in the 2018 Halloween reboot. Sam and Tara run into Abe Snake Bodega for help. Abe Snake was a pseudonym that Wes Craven used to make adult films in the 70s. Behind the counter, we see a picture of a dog, the same dog on Dewey's fridge. We also see a picture of a man who is flagged for not being served on future visits. One of our subscribers has pointed out that maybe this is a still shot from a Dahmer movie. It does kind of look a little bit like Jeffrey Dahmer. After Sam and Tara escape, we see that Ghostface left his mask behind in the bodega, similar to the killer in Scream 2 after killing Randy but also similar to the photos left behind in Scream 3 of Sydney's mother. Now let's jump forward to the scene where Sam and Tara leave the police station. Gail confronts the Carpenter sisters in the crowd of news reporters and quickly dodges a punch from Sam. I find this funny because if you missed it, go and take a look at an Easter egg video we dropped on Scream Month, which was on Gail's website. And on Gail's website, it says the best ways to treat a black eye. This is a part of that list. Yes, it is. Now, while Sam missed, Tara didn't. And we found out that Gail has written another book attacking the victim's character, Sam, just like she did with Sydney in the original Scream. Tatum, it's okay. She's just doing her job, right, Kim? Yes, that's right. So, how's the book? Well, it'll be out later this year. Oh, I'll look for it. I'll send you a copy. Oh! oh. Oh, we see Gail's cameraman respond the exact same way that her cameraman in Scream 2 did. We arrive at Dr. Stone's house where he's eating ice cream and watching the invasion of the body snatchers. You fools, you're in danger! Can't you see? They're here already! You're next. This is another poster hanging up in the Meeks home in Scream 5. On his entertainment center is a VHS tape with the logo for the YouTube channel Dead Meat, whose podcasters Chelsea Rebecca and James A. Janice were in Scream 5 reviewing the latest Stab movie. When Ghostface knocks at the door, we hear the same audio score used in the film X, which was performed by director Ty West. Jenna Ortega also had a role in that film. All right, Scream fans. We have something special for you. So if you're watching this Easter egg video, it's the first time at Nerdbox. We got plenty of Scream content. Go and check out the Scream playlist that we have set up. But who wants to play a game of Sue's Clues? If you don't know what I'm talking about, then go look at our popcorn theories where we have Ghostface narrating each film in the franchise telling you the clues that reveal that Stu is still alive. Did you ever wonder who killed Rebecca? Was it Charlie? Or was it Jill? Maybe, just maybe it was someone else. Since Jill was inside getting stitched up, and Charlie was outside filming. So who could it be? Who could the third ghost face be at the hospital? After all, it's not like we've seen a third killer at the hospital any other time. Oh wait. Check out all of the Stu's Clues videos as I break down each film and reveal how Stu has been there for everyone. And remember to stab that like button. 
comment, share, and subscribe to Nerdbox. And if you think he's dead and you want to argue about it, you can. But go and check out those clues and then debate us there because we're always open up for a debate. Just will never convince me. Just keep it nice in the comments. Yes, be nice. And if you still want to talk about the TV falling on his head, we have a whole video on that too, proving that, um, yeah, couldn't have killed him. So go and check out that Scream content. Didn't kill my cousin. We thank you and let's get back to the list. In the park, Mindy is delivering her monologue on the rules of a franchise and references other established horror franchises and non-horror franchises in their universe. Laurie Strode's death in Halloween Resurrection, Nancy Thompson in Nightmare on Elm Street 3, Ellen Ripley in Alien 3, Sally Hardesty in Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2022, Jigsaw in Saw 3, Tony Stark in Avengers Endgame, James Bond in No Time to Die. Luke Skywalker in Star Wars The Last Jedi. Annika is wearing a green jacket, similar to what Randy wore in Scream 2 before his death. Just like Randy, she's the next person to die in the friend group. At the police station, Detective Bailey alerts Kirby that the doctor has been killed and tries to plant seeds to Sam being the murderer. Kirby redirects his attention to the crime board, but she has to leave the room after she receives a call. And we see Bally ask, Hey Jack, you call the Atlanta field office. Jack is a reference to Jack Quaid, who played Richie in Scream 5. Later that evening, Chad declares them the core four, acknowledging what fans refer to them as. Sam's boyfriend Danny, who lives across the alley, notices Ghostface creep up on Quinn and watches her supposed death, just like Jill and Kirby did in Scream 4 with Olivia being attacked in the house across from them. Ghostface tosses Quinn's body through the door in an attempt to stage her death, just like we saw Stu do with Billy in Scream 1 and then Roman attempt to do with himself in Scream 3. Everyone runs off after Ghostface attacks Annika next. Sam barricades the door and yells for Mindy to shut the bathroom door. She runs past a body in the shower, which is a reference to Psycho. Luckily for Sam and Mindy, Danny just happens to have an extendable ladder in his New York apartment. Here we get two references. The first to the movie Nerve, which starred Emma Roberts, AKA Jill in Scream 4. The next is Judgment Night, where Mason Gooding's father, Cuba Gooding Jr., had to crawl across a ladder too. Fortunately, Annika falls to her death, and the next day, Gail leads everybody to the Ghostface Shrine. Gail uses a key card to unlock the door. Like in Scream 3, Jennifer Jolie and Gail had to use a key card to get into the archive of Sunrise Studios. Gail Weathers would find a way out. Before we dive into all of the Easter eggs in the shrine, we're going to do a little bit different this time. We're going to do it by film. Scream 1. We have Stu's smoking jacket, Billy's bloody shirt, Randy's video store shirt, Kenny the cameraman's jacket and hat, Tatum's outfit, and the recreation of Stephen Orth's death scene with the taped down dummy wearing his jacket. In the cases, we have the knife Casey Becker was killed with, the scissors along with the mask that Principal Himbry cut, and the rope he was hung by, Dewey's deputy badge, and the umbrella Sidney stabbed Billy with. Around the cases, we have the TV used to cover up Stu's death, the Woodsboro High flagpole with flag, the swing used to hang Casey Becker, just behind Kenny's mannequin is his camera and bag of Cheetos. Hanging from the balcony is a section of the garage door that killed Tatum. And let's not forget Billy's knife is with his robe. For Scream 2, we have the costume given to Phil and Maureen at the beginning of Scream 2, a Windsor collar shirt, Mickey's handheld camera, the sun prop from Sydney's play that Derek was killed on with one of the masks on it, and Mrs. Loomis's gun. Next is Mrs. Loomis's suit and her name tag. And finally, we have the popcorn machine in the lobby set up on the counter in the same spot that it was in the theater in Scream 2. 
For Scream 3, we have cases that feature Jennifer Jolie's fax machine, along with Tom Prince's lighter that blew up her home, the frying pan used to knock out Stone, Roman's voice changer in his case with the gun used to shoot him, a bulletproof vest, and behind Ethan is a banner for Cotton Weary's TV show. The slate and script from the failed Stab 3 production hanging over the entrance where they're walking in is the Happy Birthday Roman banner from Milton's Mansion. And finally for Scream 3, the green ghost face mask that was hanging in the studio is hanging on the wall. In the Scream 4 cases, we see the knife used to stab Kirby, a Stabathon shirt, and Dewey's Sheriff's badge. At the entrance, Charlie's shirt, then there is Olivia's bloody shirt and shorts, Jill's flannel, Deputy Haas's bloody uniform shirt, Trevor's jacket, shirt, and bloody crotch pants. And then for Scream 5, we have Dewey's gun in his case and some stab movies. The most interesting case is Gail's, which features all of her books, which we'll count as one. Wrongfully Accused, Woodsboro Murders, College Terror, Hollywood Horror, Knife of Doom, Ghostface Returns, Knife of the Hunter, and The Clock of Doom. The one book that we're not going to count is Stabbed in the Back, The Real Sunrise Studios Stories. Now this ties into promotional websites that Dimension Films had created for Scream 3, and we covered that in our past video, so you get to see them right here. They'll be popping up on the screen. Now after everyone explores the shrine, we see Mindy sit with Kirby. They begin to rattle off horror movie franchise favorites with each other, and they start with the best Nightmare on Elm Street movie being the original. Best Friday the 13th, Mindy says part two, and Kirby says the final chapter because of her crush on Corey Feldman. Next, they agree on Psycho 2 being underrated. They both agree that the original Candyman and the reboot were great. Gail finds Sam in the lobby who is upset and consoles her. Dewey's theme music plays during this scene. Bailey comes up with a plan to catch Ghostface, which is having Sam and Tara walk through the park as bait. The park where they are, we see a person with a killer clowns from outer space mask on. Mindy, Chad, and Ethan are in a nearby van with Kirby. Mindy explains to everyone that they're still not safe, reminding them of her uncle Randy's death in which he was pulled into a van and killed in broad daylight. Ethan is chomping away on some Cheetos. This is something we saw Kenny do in Scream 1 when he and Gail were staking out Stu's house. Now without fail, Ghostface calls Sam and he stays on the phone just long enough for Kirby to be able to trace it back to an address. Gail's address. Gail lives on West 96th Street, a nod to the film's release in 1996. Ghostface calls Gail to taunt her, keeping her distracted while her boyfriend is killed and thrown through the bookshelf. On the floor, we see Gail's latest book, The Woodsboro Horror Continues. That is obviously the book that she wrote about what happened with Sam and Tara in the last film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, you know, she just couldn't help herself. Mm. <laughs> Ghostface chases Gail into a room where she barricades herself so that she can get her gun. Gail fires several rounds into the door that Ghostface is trying to break down. He calls her back on the phone again, and we hear him reference wearing a bulletproof vest. This is a reference to Roman wearing the vest in Scream 3. And the ghost face in the hospital wearing one under the robe in Scream 5. We see a picture of her and Dewey next to the phone. This is the same one we saw in Dewey's trailer in Scream 5. Gail hangs up on Ghostface and then dials Star 69 to hear where Ghostface was hiding in the house. This is a nod to Maureen in Scream 2 yelling at the screen. Bitch, hang the phone up and Star 69 is ass. Damn. Who is this? For some of you that don't know what Star 69 is, back in the 90s, when somebody tried to prank you, you just dial star 69, which still works today, I believe. And it calls back the person that called you. If you have a landline. Yes. Or before you make the phone call, you can star 67 it and it blocks your number. Oh, look at the cool things we could do. After that attack, we see the core four and the remaining survivors descend into the subway to head to the theater to lure Ghostface into a trap. 
The subway station they are in has the number 96 posted throughout the station. Another nod to Scream 1. As they enter the subway car, we hear the faint chant of Evil Dies Tonight, which is a reference to Halloween Kills. At the theater, we see a marquee that reads Jennifer Jolie Retrospective on one side and Rocky Horror Picture Show on the other side. Sam pulls out her phone and begins to scroll through her contacts, and we see several Easter eggs here. Sydney, for one. Meyer is the son of Scream 6 producer William Turak. Eloise is his daughter. Nikki is a character from VHS that Matt and Tyler directed. Eileen is the wife of director Tyler Gillette. Jay is a film editor. T-Ferg is a post-production assistant, Tyler Ferguson, and Rebecca may be a reference for Rebecca from Scream 4. We'll count all of those names as one. In the theater lobby, we see several of the stab posters, all counted as one for this list. As our events unfold inside the theater, it is the second film in the series to end in a theater. Scream 2 was the other. After Chad is left for dead, Sam and Tara decide to take the fight to both Ghostface killers. Sam grabs a brick from inside the shrine, a callback to Sydney dropping the bricks on Mrs. Loomis in Scream 2. With Quinn being Detective Bailey's daughter, her name is a reference to a girl in the Insidious Chapter 3 who plays Dermot Moroni's daughter in the film. When Detective Bailey arrives at the theater with his gun drawn on Kirby, who also has her gun drawn on him, she yells out to turn around when she notices Ghostface walking up behind him, just like when Sydney noticed Ghostface walking up behind Billy in Scream. Only this time around, Kirby gets shot instead of Bailey getting stabbed as a red herring kill like Billy was. We get our ghost face reveals. Quinn says, You didn't see that one coming, did you? Yeah, because you died. You kind of didn't. Just like Mickey said to Sydney and Gail, Nice twist, huh? Didn't see it coming, did you? In a similar line, Tara says, Real great parenting job, by the way. Shut your whore fucking mouth! Like Sydney said to Mrs. Loomis in Scream 2, Billy was perfect. You did a bang up job, Mrs. Loomis. We see Tara drive her knife into Ethan's mouth, a reference to Lila Crane's death in Psycho 2. After Sam and Tara fend off Quinn and Ethan, we see Bailey looking for Sam and have the tables turn on him where he is called by her using a voice changer and then attacked by Sam who is wearing the robe and mask just like Sydney did in Scream 1 when she burst out of the closet with the umbrella and stabbed it into Billy's chest. After stabbing Detective Bailey to death, Sam and Tara walk through the movie screen while Richie Film rolls the credits with the directed by Richie Kirch in red font just like the Twin Peaks ending. Somehow Ethan survived the knife into his mouth and run towards Sam and Tara only to have a TV tossed on his head causing him to fall to the ground with it on his head. Mirroring Stu in the first Scream. Kirby emerges from the shadows sporting a similar cut as Mickey in Scream 2. And finally, we hear Kirby say that she saw it in a scary movie once, which would be a reference to the film's original title and Stab 1. To wrap up our list, we are going to talk about all the Easter eggs and references that were found at the frat party and during the subway scene. And there's been several more since then. And like before, what we're going to do is we're going to put them all into categories and we're going to start with the Wes Craven films. We have Sadie from 1972's Last House on the Left. A character from Deadly Blessing. Freddy Krueger from Nightmare on Elm Street. Samantha Pringle from Deadly Friend. We have Horace Pinker and Allison Clemson from Shocker. And then we have the Daddy and Child from People Under the Stairs. We have Preacher Polly and Detective Rita Vader, Vampire in Brooklyn. Then we see someone wearing a number 10 jersey, which is the same jersey that not only Tatum wears in Scream 1, but also Glenn in Nightmare on Elm Street. There are several people dressed in celebrity costumes like Jennifer Lopez, Gloria Steinem, David Bowie, Julia Fox, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Andy Warhol, Klaus Nomi, Angela Davis, Orville Peck, Spike Lee, then we have Michael Jackson rocking his silver glove and then Britney Spears in the schoolgirl outfit. Some of the crew got in on this as well. Co-director Bettinelli Olpin dressed as Kurt Cobain while Gillette wore a fake butcher knife in his head. 
Scream 6 cinematographer Brett Jukowitz wore the grabber's mask from Black Phone. And then William Sherrick did not wear a costume, but his daughter did. She dressed up as Eloise. Now, the Scream slash horror universe references we see are Michael Myers and Dr. Samuel Loomis. Loomis, as we know, is the namesake of Billy Loomis from Scream. A person dressed as Casey Becker, Sean from Shaun of the Dead, which is also a nod to Scream 4 when we see Kirby is watching that movie. Sherry, played by Lucy Hale from the Stab 6 opening. Grace LaDomas from Ready or Not, whose part was played by Samara Weaving. A girl dressed up as Wednesday Adams, another nod to Jenna Ortega's TV show. Mojo Jojo from the Powerpuff Girls walking up the steps in the train station. Mojo is one of Roger Jackson's many characters that he does voices for. Moving on to the horror and movie themed costumes. Jason Voorhees, Peach Fuzz from Creep, a person wearing a mask from the movie Eyes Without a Face, Melanie Daniels from the movie The Birds, a person is wearing the original butcher's apron and gloves from Videodrome, John Trent from In the Mouth of Madness, Pinhead, Chucky, and Tiffany from Child's Play. Hayoko from The Grudge, The Handmaids from The Handmaid's Tale, The Television Show, Pluto from Us, as well as several people dressed as the tethered Papa Legba from American Horror Story, Danny from Midsommar, Emerald Haywood from Nope, The Nun from The Conjuring Universe, Alice Sweet Alice, and The Babadook. Non-horror costumes. Alan from The Hangover with baby Carlos strapped to his chest, Maverick from Top Gun, Sonic the Hedgehog, Dwight Schrute from The Office, and a girl dressed up like Harry Potter. Now we dive into Stephen King references. As we see one of Pennywise's red balloons being held by Georgie, who is sporting his yellow raincoat. Isaac from Children of the Corn, Carrie, Grady Twins from The Shining. And the last one for Stephen King is Doc Halloran. Oh my God, that was a lot of Easter eggs and references. Over 200. So many that we forgot to finish the ending for this video. So we're coming back a day later to record it. He's on cough medicine. It's okay. Oh yeah. It's a good time to watch it in the mouth of madness. If you haven't seen that movie, when you're sick and on cough medicine, watch it. You're not going to know what's going to happen at the end or if you're in the right world or not. Yeah, he did that to me once when I was on cold medicine. Fun times. <laughs> anyway, did we miss anything? There's a lot out there, so there's probably a bunch more that we haven't found or our subscribers or people watching our videos haven't found. So just let us know by dropping it in the comments. And don't forget to check out our Scream playlist. Check out all the Easter egg videos we have out on Scream. Theories, behind the scenes for every single film except for this last one. There's a lot of stuff out there for Scream lovers and Terrifier as well. Anyway, don't forget to do a couple of things. Like, share, comment, and subscribe. Yes. As always, we appreciate you for watching this video and have a great night until the next See ya. See ya.